I am Dr. Angela Bassick, a lecturer with the Dial Center for Written and Oral Communication. My expertise is in the writing end of things more than um, the science end of things, for those of you who are in the sciences. Um, but I can give you some pointers on how to write the proposal. Proposals follow kind of standard formats, and every funding source will have specific guidelines that you must follow. Um, however, there are some general tips that I can give you about the quality of the writing itself. Because you are in the pool with big fish, and you are trying to get money, as is everyone else. And they will put their best foot forward. And while you cannot make a bad idea sound great with great writing, because they will see through that, the people reading these documents are intelligent, they are leaders in their field, but they will be able to, um, if you make it your writing so obtuse um, that they don't want to take the time to read the rest of the document, you will sink your application in that way. So you need to have your writing be as clear and simple as possible. Um, our favorite uh, father of science, Albert Einstein, if you can't explain something simply, you don't understand it well. Um, so one of your tasks is to find the clearest possible expression of your idea and to place that clear expression of the idea within the context of your discipline. Um, if, you, if you don't do those two things, there's no way that um, they're going to do it for you as they read your application. They aren't going to pick up that slack. There are a couple of different types of fellow, uh, fellowship applications. Uh, one is internal to the school. As you move forward in your graduate careers, um, you will find that there are some sources of funding internal to UF where you can apply for dissertation grants and things like that. There are also uh, external uh, funding sources as you get further along in your, uh, in your profession that you will be applying to. It's a good idea to try to get some of those smaller ones um, as a way to build stepping stones toward those larger um, grant funding opportunities. General preparation advice, always discuss your project with your faculty mentor. Uh, try to review prior successful proposals. Many of these are available online. Many funding sources will provide examples of, of uh, proposals that have worked in the past. And so do your homework. Find out, not, not because their ideas are the same as yours, because, but because you will see something about how they express themselves. And one of the best ways to learn how to write something well is to read many, many versions of exactly that kind of document. Um, so familiarize yourself with the kinds of language um, that is used in this environment. Um, uh, you would have to obtain IRB approval, obviously, if that's necessary for your particular project in some of your disciplines, that is, and in some it isn't. Um, as the previous speaker mentioned, different kinds of funding sources have very specific guidelines, um, and you have to follow them to the T. So when you get a copy of those guidelines, digest them, study them, make a checklist of all the items you need to include, what kinds of things they want you to do, so that you have a clear idea of what your, what your mission is. Um, if there's scoring criteria, if it's a highly formalized process, you can learn something about what that criteria um, set is and try to meet the needs uh, of your reader in that way. Um, if materials are submitted online, go ahead and, and log into the site and learn a little bit about what kinds of questions they're going to ask you. Sometimes you have to fill in the response boxes there online, but you don't want to do that as you're sitting there at the last moment. You want to see what the question is and try to um, come up with an answer to it separately, well edited, um, well drafted, and then submit it. Um, if there are required forms or procedures you have to follow with your host institution here at UF, um, they go ahead and gather all those materials um, well in advance. Some general writing advice. As you draft your proposals, obviously you have to fit with the instructions uh, that the source has given you. You have to write as clearly and concisely as possible and seek advice from multiple readers. And when I say multiple readers, I don't just mean everybody on your committee or people in your field. I mean that you need to seek advice from readers who are not in your field. Because not everybody on the review committee will be specifically in your area of expertise. They might be still in chemistry, but they aren't necessarily studying what you are specifically studying. And so you have to get a feel for how they're going to respond to your text. So get both inside and outside of your discipline uh, readers from both of those groups. 
revise the text excessively, which requires pre-planning. You have to have written these things far enough in advance that you can give a person two, three weeks to read it over for you. Just because you hand it to them today doesn't mean they're going to read it and hand it back to you tomorrow. You have to build in that time, build in that time for revision, build in that time uh, to seek advice and to revise, and do it through multiple layers um, so that you will have the best document you possibly can. What makes a good fellowship application? Following the directions is key. Fitting the funding source's goals and priorities is another big one. Um, if different funding sources will have their general guidelines, their general goals, their general mission statement, but they also have particular areas of interest that they publicize that are their current priorities. And if your proposal fits that need and that mission, then you have a better chance. Um, so, you know, you have to look through what they're, interest, what they're interested in funding in order to pick a, a source that is in line with your objectives. You also need to, in your document, obviously write clearly and concisely. We'll talk specifically about ways of doing exactly that in just a minute. Um, but you also have to identify a problem and provide the solution to that problem in any kind of proposal, and a fellowship is no different. It also has to be practical and feasible. Um, you have to be the kind of person through your curriculum vitae who is capable of doing the work you propose. And that's important. One of the ways that um, funding sources will say no to a proposal is that you propose something for which you are not prepared as a researcher. Um, and this is a comment by um, Ann Etchen uh, with uh, the Einstein College of Medicine. The most common mistake that first-time applicants make is proposing to do 20 years worth of work in somewhere between three and five years. That shows a lack of understanding of the basic needs of the science in your discipline that you propose that you can do something that they themselves know is impossible in that time frame. So be careful of over-proposing um, when you do this um, so that you will have a proposal that makes sense in that way. Typical proposal elements, and these you want to look to the guidelines of the particular funding source, but in general, you're trying to accomplish these objectives. You need to introduce your problem with a goal statement. You need to show a gap in the existing knowledge that will be the gap that your research is going to fill, um, which comes to the statement of background and significance. The significance is the gap that you're going to fill with your own research. And the background is showing that you know what your discipline, um, where it stands at this moment, and how your own research fits into that background. Um, without that kind of explanation, you want to make it as clear and easy as possible for them to understand that your work matters, and it matters, and you know why it matters, and you can explain well to them how it fits in the current discourse. Um, so some of the things you have to include in the, in the detailed structure of the plan are your methods, uh, your expected results. Also be careful if, you, if you're structuring one of the quotes, which I didn't include in a slide um, from a, a research scientist, was that sometimes people will propose a plan where if step one goes wrong in your research, if you don't get result A, then everything else in the plan depends on getting result A, then you've set up a, a, a proposal that requires that you be right about condition A. Well, they're not going to want to fund a proposal for all of that science if condition A fails. That needs to be your preliminary work, right? Don't set up a structure, a rhetorical structure, where if, if test A fails, then the rest of the research doesn't have a purpose, right? All, do that step A as preliminary uh, research and include it as part of um, the background material, material that you give. Um, your dissemination of results. How are you going to publish this? What venues are you going to use? Um, or a try to use. Two basic kinds of outlines, and these will vary according to funding source. Go to your funding source's requirements and meet them, but this is the general idea of things that might be in that set of requirements. <coughs> Some will require an abstract, um, a description of preliminary work, and that's extremely important if you have the kind of project where result A is necessary to justify the doing of the rest of the, of the research. Um, and so result A needs to be in that preliminary description. Um, I've succeeded in doing this, and now I want to find out if this is also the case. So set up that rhetorical structure. What is the significance of your work? 
overall in terms of your discipline and within the narrow uh, area uh, of that discipline where you are focused? What is your hypothesis or the research question that drives your research? Um, what, are, what is your specific methodology? Um, and what resources do you have in terms of your own personal qualifications, in terms of other people you can bring to bear in the course of doing that research? As you start to establish a lab, as you get further along in your discipline, um, you will be able uh, to bring more available resources to bear uh, in your grant applications. And one of the statistics Mickey was telling me just a little while ago, as we were sitting in the back of the room here, is that there has been a real shift in the, in the pattern of funding history so that years and years ago, um, and I'm not sure, I just heard the statistics, so I don't remember exactly how long ago, but the pattern was that younger, more innovative, innovative research was at the top of the most funded kinds of projects, and older, established kinds of research projects were less likely to be approved. That, that channel has reversed, that pattern has reversed, and now the more established the science, the more resource, resources that can be brought to bear in the course of the application procedure, um, the more likely the funding. So that is a shift in the fundamental dynamics of grant, granting of money that affects um, you know, your chances. Uh, and so an explanation of your personal qualifications and your available resources. Another one of the quotes that I, that I was reading about uh, and uh, preparing for this <coughs> was a researcher who uh, decides on NSF grants um, and they were saying you want to make sure that if you do bring to bear uh, other colleagues who are going to work with you on the project that you make sure you make it clear in your description that you are the principal investigator. That you aren't you know, the, the person who's writing the grant but you're not the leader in charge of the mission, right? You want to make sure that you make it clear that you're in charge but you're also drawing on these resources. Um, and that's kind of tricky to evaluate sometimes. Uh, your dissemination plan and your future goals. If you're, if you're engaged in a kind of research that is going to produce results that will lead to something significant in the discipline, those results you have just argued in the, in the beginning of this, of this uh, persuasive document matter in some way. You have to have some statement about what your future goals, like where would you go, you know, once you decide or once you investigate or once you find out the answers to these questions, where is it likely to take you? Right? To show them the trajectory or the vector of where your research is going, you need to do that as well. Um, so these are all the kinds of things. Now, any given proposal might drop out one or two of these elements. Um, uh, for instance, you might not have, they might not require that you put qualifications in the proposal. They might ask that you turn in CVs separately. So there are structural dynamics where it might not be in the proposal, but it will be in there in terms of information. information. Um, what convinces reviewers to accept your proposal in this, you know, 10% margin area or 5% margin area where you might get money. Um, good ideas. Good ideas are absolutely necessary. You've got to have a really good project idea. But good ideas can be sunk by writing them poorly. Um, and the reason for that is that people who are reviewers, and we'll talk about this in a minute, they don't have time to drag through your research and find the kernel of wisdom you obviously have. They want it spoon-fed to them as easily as possible. This is not their day job, right? They have their own research to do. They're moving on. Um, a concretely defined topic with limited scope. Again, you don't want to propose that you're doing 20 years of research in three or five years. You want to propose that you are actually doing something you can realistically accomplish with your skill set and available resources. Substance and significance, that it matters in your discipline. Uh, an engaging and accessible style in the writing does not hurt you, right? They are reading lots of equally valid proposal, and the line between funded and not funded is very, very thin, right? The line between being number four who gets the money and number five who doesn't get the money is a hair's breadth. So don't let your writing come between you and the money. Uh, clarity and concision with a limited use of jargon. Realize that the people reading your document, even the peer reviewers reading your document, aren't necessarily experts in your precise area. They'll be in this general field, but they won't be necessarily in your precise area. So you have to be careful about jargon. Uh, another uh, quotation uh, from Randall T. Moon, a Howard Hughes Medical Institute uh, investigator and professor of pharmacology at the University of Washington in Seattle. Be organized. I have to be able to read these grants in a non-linear manner. He wants to jump around in your text. That means you have to have logical headers. 
that make sense with the paragraphs that go under them. If your header says a particular piece of information ought to be there, he darn well better find it when he goes and reads that paragraph, right, if he's looking for something. I jump from the specific aims to the methods, then I look to the CV and ask, can this person really pull this off, right? Ask for things that make sense with your uh, available skill set. What reviewers examine? The significance of the work, the intellectual merit, the probability of success. They want to fund things that work, right? Feasibility, applicants' qualifications, those both, both speak to what um, Mr. Moon just said. Uh, broader applicability and implications. Is it going to be significant? Am I going to fund something that I can write a press release about saying, look at this great piece of research we discovered so that we can get good press for us because we funded you? That's a part of the give and take of this whole process. Um, fulfillment of the criteria established by the agency uh, in its request for proposal. Make sure you fulfill whatever the requirements are. If something's missing, they're not going to go looking for it and they are not going to ask you for it. They're just going to put you on the no pile. So be sure that you've followed directions. And I don't know how to say Ms. Plo's name very well, but he, hide Plo, he Plo. Many people think that somehow the concentration of every buffer component must be specified. When they ask for specific detail, that is not what they mean, right? We are interested in what the experiments seek to establish. What, the, what are your controls and how will you interpret your results? They don't want the nitty gritty of every little speck, right? They are busy people, but they want to be convinced. They want solid and specific information, not generality and cliche, but they don't want it that specific. So you have to balance what kind of stuff you put in there. Um, understanding what, who your audience is. In any kind of writing circumstance, your audience matters more than anything else, and understanding what their needs are matters. Uh, NSF reviewers are typically a third from the broader field in which you are uh, applying for a grant, in chemistry, for instance, a third in the study area of genetics, a third might be in the specific area of whatever that is, G protein, B3, subunit polymorphism, and I don't know what that is, but maybe some of you do. Um, but you get the idea. They will be divided up in that way, where, um, where some of them will have very good knowledge of exactly what you're talking about. They will be your harshest critics. They will be the ones who know whether you are BSing them or not, right? They will be the ones to say, eh, but if they champion your piece in the room where they get around and talk about your work, then the other folks will defer to them. Uh, some reviewers are careful and others are too busy like the rest of us and they don't have time to spend a week writing your, reading your paper, um, which is what Peter Walter, an HHMI, Howard Hughes Medical uh, Institute investigator and professor of biochemistry and biophysics at the University of California in San Francisco said. There are no tricks. Just write it so it's readable. I cannot spend a week reading each grant. I am busy. I have a day job. I am doing my own work, which I care about, and I'm trying to fund myself, right? So keep that in mind. Why do reviewers reject a proposal? The importance of the goal of the work is unclear. They don't know exactly what you're doing and exactly how it fits in your discipline. They're not going to take the time to figure it out. You have to have done that work for them. The feasibility is in question. They're not sure you can pull it off. The plan is fuzzy. They're not sure about your method in some way. Um, they're not sure it can be done on that time frame or in that budget. So make sure your, your information is as accurate as possible. They've done these things before. They know exactly what to expect. Um, and that's one of the real reasons you have to get every faculty advisor that you can get to read your proposal. You should have every one of them read it. And they will give you conflicting advice particularly about writing details. They'll give you conflicting advice. But in terms of what they know best, right, which is whether or not it's a feasible project and whether or not it's um, something you uh, can uh, claim to have the, the background to do in that time frame and with that budget, um, they can help you there. Realize uh, one of the other reasons is that the prime and principal investigator lacks credibility because the writing is so bad. If the writing is so bad, the nature of science is this. You can sit in a room and do great science. You could solve tremendous problems. University of Florida currently has 100 products that are patented that are not going to market um, because the researchers invent great things, test them out, and no one carries them forward um, and gets them into 
uh, use, clinical practical use. And so one of the things UF is doing currently is trying to facilitate that technology transfer. Um, but researchers don't do that technology transfer. They try to get uh, marketing folks to do that. Um, the writing quality, though, in terms of science, if you're going to finish this project and your plan for dissemination of the information is that you are going to write an article that you hope to have appear in science or nature or whatever, and you write so badly that they can't read your document on the proposal, they are not going to expect that you can produce a really good essay for a journal article. And then they are not going to get press from having paid for all this great research. That is one of the reasons why the writing has to be so good. Because they want to know that you can then get publicity for the project they funded by publishing the results in a respected journal. So these things matter. And Etchen again with the Einstein, uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Neatness counts. Misspellings, grammar errors, and incorrect references all reflect badly on your judgment. Take the time to have these documents prepared early enough that you can have other people read them so that you can get good feedback and, and uh, uh, make sure that the document is perfect before you click send. Having a process automated does make it much easier, but it's also easier to click send and read it and say, oh no, I can't believe I did that. So, um, you know, you've all had freshman comp essays where you got it back and you said, oh dear, I can't believe I wrote that sentence that way. And I know I've graded them, so, um, you know, be careful about those kinds of things. Um, one of the tips for uh, reviewing your own work, because you are so close to the work, because you are so close to the writing, it's an excellent idea to read it from the bottom to the top, sentence by sentence, out loud, to catch simple errors. When you're down to the proofreading stage, try to do it that way. Um, because you start to fill in the blanks. You know, there's that paragraph with no vowels that 60% of the population can read, probably all of you can, um, where you can read the entire thing with no vowels in the entire paragraph. Um, it's similar to that. You fill in the blanks of your own writing because you're so familiar with it. Um, so try to, uh, to be careful in that way. You want to avoid absurd complexity. You want to avoid unnecessary clutter. You want to have the language choices that you make be as clear as possible. This sentence is absurdly complex. The most recent discrepancy compilation demonstrates the origin of the dysfunction resulting in the immediate implementation. Everybody wants to snore. No one wants to read that, especially people who read this kind of stuff all the time. They're bored, they're tired, they don't want to do this, they want to get their own research done. So don't give them that, right? The new list of errors shows where the breakdown begins. The error must be corrected immediately. It's very clear it doesn't take me a lot of brain power to figure out what the person meant in that second sentence. Avoid pompous diction and unnecessary jargon. Do not say feedback, parameters, commensurate, aforementioned, commence, input. Utilize, it's just use, come on. Uh, transmit, fabricate, monetarily felt scarcity. They were poor. Avoid convoluted sentence structure and excessively long subordinate phrases. Publicizing the records of a private meeting that took place three weeks ago to reveal the identity of a manager who criticized our company promotion policy would be unapproved. By the time you get to unethical, which is the whole point of the sentence, you're snoring. It's just way too down the pipe in that sentence. Try to be uh, much more direct than that. Avoid negatives and double negatives wherever possible. The problem cannot be solved without the aid of further research. Further research is necessary. To establish what? Be specific. Avoid nominalizations. A nominalization is when you turn a verb, an action word that makes your writing sound alive and like it's doing something. Just like your research should be doing something into a noun which is not the what you want to do. Uh, the utilization of a reflective matrix is required for the optimization of the schema. This is not the best way to write that sentence, right? Because you want to act like things are being done, things are happening, things are occurring. Try to use verbs. Avoid noun strings. Operator initiated default prevention technique is much harder to follow than a technique for preventing defaults initiated by the operator. You don't want the reviewer to get that brain fog that occurs when they have to, to concentrate so hardly on figuring out what the words say and mean. Your work is complicated enough. You're working on graduate level studies. There is high level content in the work you do. Don't make the language choices make it impenetrable for the reviewer. It's not that you're trying to convince them you're smart. They know you're smart. Hopefully the project shows you're smart because it's a good idea. 
describe it well and clearly so that they don't have to work to understand it. Eliminate wordy phrases and redundancies due to the fact that is always because. Don't do it any other way. The majority of something is most of that thing. Try not to use words like completely before eliminate. If you eliminate it, it's eliminated completely. It's in the definition of the word eliminate. <laughs> mental awareness. If you are aware, you are mentally aware. There is no other definition for aware. The end result is always the end result because it's the result, right? <laughs> the month of August is always a month. It's August. If it wasn't, it'd be Augustine if it was a person. <laughs> Avoid opening sentences that begin with there and it. There is a danger of explosion in the use of the compound. If you're talking about something exploding, you should probably be much more direct than that, right? The compound may explode. Explosions are possible. Danger. Try to keep the writing logically flowing. You want this person to, effort the, to, have, to feel no foggy effort in how they read through your document. You want them to just think, oh, it logically makes sense, this flows into that, that happens, that happens, that happens, they will get this result or that result. It makes total sense, I get it. That's the response you want. And the idea itself will then carry the day. But the idea cannot carry the day if you write it in this dense fog that they find impenetrable on their Saturday when they'd rather be with their kids. And they're trying to get through all these uh, proposals they were told to read. Tell the story of your project. Realize that in any case, a persuasive document is in a way a narrative. You are narrating what you intend to do. So tell that story. Show how it fits in the larger discourse. Stylistically, coherence is what you accomplish in your paragraphs, but also with the overall structure, although that is given to you in the requirements in large part. And some logic is built into that. Uh, but up for your part, you have to build the paragraphs in a logical way. Try to keep each paragraph relatively short. Use clear topic sentence at the beginning. Um, in this kind of work, you are trying to, as clearly as possible, tell the people what you're doing. You are not trying to hide some surprise at the end of the paragraph. This is not that kind of essay writing. Um, be upfront with what you're talking about. Use transitions between sentences and re uh, reference keywords so that they can easily follow where you're going uh, and create a logical sequence that's easy to follow. This is an example, uh, and I won't read the whole thing, but I'm going to break it up for you in a, in a kind of blue letter way. Uh, this is a little paragraph about solar power. The first sentence is the topic sentence. Solar power offers an efficient, economical, and safe solution to the Northeast energy problems. Clear. It just states a fact. The center part goes through a logical progression with, with flag phrases, signal phrases that will tell you what's going on and set the stage at the start of the sentence for what's happening next, which I will click on in a second. All that middle part is the process. Uh, and the concluding sentence, thus, right? Thus says I'm concluding, right? Massive conversation, conversion uh, to solar power would ensure abundant energy and a safe, clean environment for future generations. The signal phrases in the middle are things like to begin with, moreover, these savings, most important in contrast, and thus. Those are the words that clearly indicate to your reader where you're going with your argument. The best one of those is um, the one that starts with these savings. And the reason for that is it clearly connects something from the previous sentence's concluding element to the next sentence's subject. And that's the way you create coherence in your, in your paragraphs. You take you know, the, the fact you closed a sentence with, that becomes the new information. The new information becomes the old information that starts the next sentence. And that helps to keep your reader uh, flowing with the point. You can use the signal phrases like to begin with and moreover in contrast. In contrast is, well, moreover is a little bit forced, right? If the logical flow of the argument is as clear as it can possibly be, you can use phrases like these savings to make it flow logically and effortlessly. You can overdo the moreovers and in conclusions, right? Be careful. They're OK in a, a little bit, but you don't want to overdo them and rely too much on them. These are different ways of coherently structuring paragraphs, and it depends on your objective, what it is you're trying to convey. A spatial sequence that describes an area, a chronological se sequence, which you will be writing in your methods sections, where you say this step follows this step follows this step, that kind of thing. Uh, cause and effect, if this happens, then this happens. Uh, emphatic sequences, problem causes, solution sequences. 
Um, these are all ways to logically structure the content of your paragraphs. You need to engage your reader. They're reading through a lot of very dry material, um, and so you want to show your enthusiasm. Don't go overboard with that, but do, do show an interest in your material in the tone that you take and the words that you choose. Um, avoid cliches and platitudes. Don't say things like, you know, um, everyone wants to live, some people do commit suicide. Those are platitudes. Um, don't make any kinds of blanket assumptions like that that you expect everyone on the face of the planet will agree with you on, because they may not. Um, try to avoid those kinds of things. Uh, platitudes are those kind of general purpose words that we use to fill our speech without thinking about what they mean. Um, when you're engaging the, the reader, this is an example of how to make it more interesting. The hydrology of the Santiam River, River watershed, if you're describing that, it's not quite as interesting if you're going to be talking about the catastrophic flood possibility to just say, I'm talking about cat catastrophic flood possibilities. Lead with a thing that, that engages the reader and catches their attention. The significance, really, of talking about this watershed is talking about the fact that if drought conditions produce the potential for catastrophic flooding, right? So lead with that excitement. Um, and reason why this is important. In summary, the whole rhetoric of the proposal should be used to your advantage. You are trying to persuade people to give you money. It is, in fact, a sales pitch in a way, but it's a sales pitch in an academic arena, and so your tone of writing needs to be focused in that way um, to make your work fit in uh, with the work of your discipline. Those are references. I'll take some questions if anybody has them. Yes? How do you deal with stylistic differences between yourself and your PI, for example? Like? That's a really, really hard one. Um, you take their advice and you say thank you very much. Um, and uh, you continue to select advice from more than one person. And then you let them know that you've got conflicting advice because different people will give you different advice. And um, ultimately, you don't have to decide what to accept. Um, but you know, the more people you ask for advice on particular questions, the more you have in terms of other commentary you can kind of share with them. And say that so-and-so says so I should do it this way, I have this piece of advice. And then it doesn't look like as confrontational from you. It would look more like I'm trying to figure out the best possible solutions that you really want to get. Other questions? Go back to the first slide where no is so we could ask you to ask my questions. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, the Dial Center um, for Written and Oral Communication is. Um, what's on? It's And we actually do offer, and Mickey's going to come up and talk a minute after I allow you to have some questions about uh, some uh, seminars that we're starting to offer to the Dial Center. Uh, we'll, we'll work with you on documents. So, um, you know, we're starting to put some of that together. Uh, and since we're in the States, so we're going to be the first group of kids to have a good time. It's very good to be getting fixed. It's good to be getting fixed. It's cheaper to be getting fixed. It's changed. Maybe so. Any other questions? Yes. Will this video be a little bit Not knowing what your outcomes are going to be, but predicting uh, at least that you know possible outcomes. It's that not yes. giving, not saying you know what you're going to find, but yes, exactly. <laughs> and you have to do that. You have to say, uh, you know, we hope to find this could be the case. It's possible this could be the case. We recognize that there's, you know, these other variables might come into play. I'm not sure how this is going to affect the study. That's why we're doing the study, right? Right. So, so you say exactly that. Right? And it shows a kind of awareness on your part that while you would expect certain outcomes, you realize you may get other outcomes. That's the nature of science. But you didn't own up to that possibility that you did not do the science. Anybody have to say something like that? Yeah.
I'm just curious to know about if the reviewers if you're, again, if you're using the first tense and the active and whatnot, you're saying we will, we will do all this stuff, or if you know, there's, I've heard this different things. This is something things. different between science writing, writing, and any English class ever. English professor will tell you, do not use passive voice, ever, 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 ever. And you know that science will do it all the time. And then you want to forget your lips. Because you're going to have to use your lips. And it's part of the rhetoric of science. It's how you get from The nature of how science gets made, how you translate the natural into the discursive, how you change from the dirt in the box, the pedo, the pedo, to this description of what that means. Um, and in, in that translation, you are getting out of the picture as a scientist performing the action, and the dirt is supposed to speak for itself. This is the magic that science performs in the methods and the results. And part of that is rhetorical in nature, and part of that is the structure of the grammar. I don't mean to say that you're not actually discovering something you are. But that's, you know, that's the, that's the nature of why you don't say I in your methods or results. And that's why in science writing you often use a passive voice. But there is good passive voice and there is bad passive voice. And I can tell you the difference between that and something. <laughs> but you know, there's ways to do it where the object is speaking, but there's still action in the word, right? But there's ways to do it where you know, I did this to the bad object. The place in science where you can use the I or the we for the researchers is in the introduction when you're saying about, you're talking about how you came to study this topic, right? You know, we thought, because of this experience, we thought about asking this question. And then you're out of the picture. And the stuff starts to speak for itself. The methods used, the, the, the research that was driven. And then the conclusion when you're forecasting out what questions researchers might need to ask in the future, you might pop back in again and say, how would you handle that with the humanities? The humanities would be uh, different. Yeah, <laughs> it's different altogether. And then, you know, when you go to the breakout sessions, you're going to get more discipline-specific information. Um, and that's why we can't go to the seminars in a kind of all-purpose group, because it really is a different part of the Yes. Are you know when you're writing as long as simple and clear? Ah. Uh, I chose, I, I've gone too far off the simple word choice. In most of these kinds of proposals, there, you will have to use some of the jargon of the discipline. It's unavoidable. But there is jargon that's jargon. You know, so there's jargon that's kind of jargon, which has no purpose except to be jargon. And then there's jargon that is actually the factual name of the object that you're describing. And then you'll go around. They are the most specific word for the thing. Um, and so you don't want to. You don't want to pull back and say a molecule when you mean, you know, a particular kind of molecule, right, with lake acid or whatever. Um, you, know, you want to say specifically what you mean. And so there's a level of complexity that you're not going to get away from when you're doing this. And if you're writing with your subordinate clauses, you've gone too far to say that. Right. That is, as, as a sophisticated adult, you know that X and Y are related to each other. And if you write them as two separate facts, you're, you're not making that collect connection clear, and then you're writing the facts that you do something. And you can see it in these, like, these almost staccato short sentences where you can erase periods and put in various transitions or just commas, and all of a sudden that action does make more sense because there's a hierarchy amongst the elements that's clearly writing itself. Most graduate students don't have a problem writing just like that. Most, yeah, most, most graduate students don't have that. Yeah. 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 Other questions? Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that position within your grant? It was too much. Remember when he, the one researcher said that he jumps around? And by jumping around, he's not, you cannot assume that he has read this other section before he And that tells you something else that he's not necessarily reading everything. Because what he's doing in the beginning is trying to decide, yay, no, yay, no, yay, no. Or yay, 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 yay. And the ones they're actually going to consider funding, they need to be And the ones they're screening for, like you. You were given 500,000 pages to read for a biology class. You read out class. Did you do the everything in that life cycle that you were told to read? Probably not. Um, but some of you probably pick the chair of the things you do on the test. You were told something to read on the test, but skip it. And in all reading instances, by all human beings, they prioritize the reading environment, and you're going to be like, 
word black is going to be prioritized that way. So like you said, he's jumping from this description to kernel. What are they going to do? How do you say this? Right? He's going to jump that. And if he thinks that's a decent idea, he's going to stick it in the main file and read the whole thing. But if he thinks, nah, we're not going to test it. It doesn't fit our priorities. I don't think they can pull it off. He's going to toss it in the file. That's his screening mechanism for deciding where to go. So realize that you want, you know, to have a, a certain level of redundancy in the session, but they are complete to themselves. So they make that their point efficiently. There might be some level of redundancy. But you don't want to go over top of that. You don't want to read the whole thing. Other questions? Okay, Nikki has some handouts as well for um, our sessions if you want to come to one of those later. But I, I mean, the, the biggest piece of advice I can give you is start early. Thank you. 